Good evening and a very warm welcome to this webinar from Liverpool Cathedral. In the cathedral, we talk about Liverpool Cathedral being a place of encounter. And we hope that you will encounter some of what we do at Liverpool Cathedral through these webinars. Liverpool Cathedral has, over the past few years, been keen to engage with science and religion. And these webinars sit in the wider context of the importance of science and faith in the cathedral. The cathedral itself contributes into research-based practice and is part of something called the Liverpool Cathedral Postgraduate Learning Community. In that community, people come to, together to discuss matters of faith, and many of them will have used the tools of the social scientists, sciences to reflect on a piece of research that they have undertaken in relation to God, the church and the world. There are now around 90 people connected to the community. As a cathedral, we have engaged in some research around Christmas attendance and the motivation of people to attend the cathedral for worship at Christmas. It is good to have on the cathedral team people who have spent their academic lives in research. And I'm grateful to the canon theologian Leslie Francis for his work and research around science and faith. And I'm also grateful to Canon Mike, who is our Canon scientist. Mike spends his paid working life as a scientist and has used his skills and experience to develop these lectures. He has done this since 2019, and they have become known as the Gilbert Scott Lecture on Science and Faith. The series name has been chosen since Dr. Sebastian Gilbert Scott brother of famous architect, architect Giles Gilbert Scott, who designed Liverpool Cathedral, was a renowned clinician and radiologist in London. Thanks to all the speakers and particularly to Claire, who will deliver this webinar and other webinars. We are very grateful. I'm now going to hand over to Canon Mike, Canon Scientist, as the organiser of the, this series. Thank you very much indeed, Dean Sue, and a very warm welcome from myself. Uh, as has been put forward, my name is Canon Mike. I'm a residential canon at the cathedral and also a university lecturer in radiotherapy physics and cancer sciences. It's a delight to welcome you all to this fourth Gilbert Scott lecture on science and faith for this year, all online because of the current situation. I hope above all you are staying well and safe in the still really challenging times. With us on this side of the camera, so to speak, are our Dean Sue, who herself is a researcher in empirical theology and psychology. Canon Neil, our Canon for Mission and Faith Development, whose own background is as an engineer. Canon Philip, our presenter at the cathedral. And Canon Stewart, our diocesan director of communications, who's our technical wizard behind all our online lectures. This evening's lecture is kindly sponsored by the Montgomery Trust. The Montgomery Trust was set up from the will of Sir Alexander Montgomery in 1937 to, and I quote, promote lectures in explanation and defense of the Christian religion with a view to removing difficulties while widely felt in the way of faith and to demonstrate the reasonableness of theistic belief. It exists to bring the insights of renowned academic and scientific minds to anyone seeking to understand faith more deeply. Dr. Claire Foster Gilbert is certainly most definitely one of those renowned academics. As before, first some housekeeping points. Please submit any questions you have for tonight's speaker into the chat or the public comment area on YouTube. I'll then ask those uh, of our speaker on your behalf after the talk in a live Q&A. The talk itself will run for about 45 minutes and all told we'll finish at about 8.40. And then I hope you'll stay with us as Canon Philip leads us in a brief service of Compline, night prayer. So we close our evening in prayer. So tonight our lecture is entitled, Miles to Go Before I Sleep, How My Cancer Became a Source of Joy, for which we are delighted to welcome Dr. Claire Foster Gilbert. Claire is a moral philosopher and theologian who has written extensively on applied ethics in medicine, environmental issues, and public life. Her publications include The Ethics of Medical Research on Humans, 
sharing God's planet, integrity in public life, and letters from lockdown, sustaining public service values during the COVID-19 pandemic. Her most recent book, Miles to Go Before I Sleep, is an account of a year of punishing treatment for myeloma, a cancer of the blood, with which she was diagnosed in March 2019. Claire is very kindly speaking live to us tonight and we'll be happy to answer questions after her talk. So without further ado, welcome Claire. Thank you very much, Mike. It's an absolute privilege to be here. I'm only sorry not to be there in person, but thanks to the wonders of technology, we can be together. I grew up laughing at my father's Jewish jokes. Here's one from Danny Finkelstein, which he would have loved. A.B. lay dying with his two sons either side of him in attendance. A.B. croaks, Sam, Sam. And his son Sam leans close to hear A.B. whisper, I can smell your mother's cooking. Delicious. Will you ask your mother if I can have one of her pastries? One last treat? I'd like that. Sam nods and goes out to the kitchen to fetch one. He takes a little while and comes back empty-handed. He leans over his father, whose eyes brighten expectantly. She says you can't have one. She's saving them for the funeral. Let's talk about death. In the last two and a half years, I have moved from theoretician to practitioner. I am, as Mike said, a published authority on the ethics of medical research on humans, on other forms of applied ethics, environmental issues, and public life. I am a theologian and a philosopher. Between them, Julian of Norwich, love of my life and subject of my doctoral thesis, and Ignatius of Loyola, whose spiritual exercises I have been privileged to undertake, were already showing me a different way to be a theologian from the systematic, rational, theoretical, argumentative way. A new way, a feeling way, an embodied way, an enacted way, a completely unvarnished, unpretending, truthful way. Julian shows me in her utterly honest writing of what she saw not what she thought she was supposed to see. And Ignatius shows me in his method of prayer in which you kindle your imagination and feel your way to your place of desolation. And you sit there, sit there, until consolation emerges from the fearful but steadfast encounter. Early in 2019, I was threatened and then diagnosed with myeloma, an incurable cancer of the blood. So very many of us and our loved ones will at some time or other also receive this news. I had to keep my family and other loved ones informed and in writing to them about what was going on, I discovered through the words themselves a means to reach right into the heart of what was happening to me and find desolation, then consolation. Not bitterness, but joy. So I asked this group if they would become my dear readers and allow me to write a diary in the form of weekly letters. You do not have to respond, I said, only to read. Writing for you, to you, who love me and understand me will be the greatest solace. Reading what I write will be the greatest service you can offer me. They said yes, so I wrote. I am still writing as my treatment has not yet finished to an expanded group. I write not, does it make sense, but how does it feel? Not what ought I to think, but what is actually going on inside me? Not what wisdom should I be sharing with the world, but 
can I so truthfully articulate what is happening that my words call spirit to life in my readers, fan the flames of joy in their hearts? I am a wordsmith, I discover. So can I make my words work as Julian's work? This, I think, is embodied theology. It is, dare I suggest, an integration of science and religion in a body. And it is risky because I am making myself entirely vulnerable. But I am going to die and I have loving friends to write to. So why not try? From my diary, 18th January, 2019. It's 20 hours since Dr. Adam told me I have a protein in my blood that might be myeloma. What an extraordinary and yet utterly ordinary thing to be told, that you might have a life-threatening condition, that you might die. Because of course, I am going to die anyway. The one certainty about being born is that one's life will end and the shock of its possibility, perhaps sooner than one thought, but one doesn't think that's the truth of it, is, I am finding, rather liberating. At last, an absolute in my life that puts everything else into perspective. I am breathing the air, loving Sean, connecting with Nutkin, my horse, on the ride this morning, seeing the sky, adoring the view of the old town from my eyrie in our house in Hastings, receiving the mighty view of the sea, enjoying the crunchy tang of an apple and so on and so on, accepting the present moment and loving it. And I'm not finding myself thinking that I will miss it or that I want to hang on to it. It is so precious, but it is itself. It will survive me, and that matters a great deal. The dear readers followed me through my diagnosis when I wrote, and I should just warn you, everybody, I am going to swear in this extract. <laughs> Friday, 8th March, 2019. I have the result. I do have myeloma, an incurable, as it turns out, cancer of the blood. My approximate prognosis with scientific understanding, current treatments, my own age and state of health, is that I will die of the condition in about 10 years, though that is very likely to be extended given the amount of research and development. I feel strange, strangely distant from the diagnosis, as if it is happening, yes, to me, but I am also someone else looking on rather quizzically a shock which I am probably reeling from, though I feel quite steady. My body is trembling a bit though. I can't really think about anything else. The newspaper doesn't arrest my attention. Yes, reeling is probably the word for it. But inwardly, I do believe I am strong. I keep thinking of the positives. In 10 years, I can do a great deal. It's not such a short time as to paralyze me. Sean is relieved that I will after all probably outlive him. So many things I don't have to worry about. Dying alone and incontinent as a discarded old lady in a home. Not having children means there are no descendants whose futures I will want to see. I don't have to worry very much about money, providing I keep my health. The clinical nurse specialist, the most lovely woman called Grace, said I should think of myeloma, and indeed a lot of cancers now, as a chronic condition, not a fatal one. Of course, it is ultimately fatal in the way that life is. It's only a bit quicker. I wouldn't want to spend the next 10 years feeling ill. So that helps me think about how I respond to treatment choices. I won't be beating this cancer or fighting it. It isn't a war with a winner and a loser. 
It's my condition. It's part of me. In my blood, my blood, which is my life force, which brings to all parts of my body all that it needs to keep functioning. I love my blood and I don't want to feel ill. I asked Dr. Mary, the haematologist who broke the news, what I should tell my loved ones. She suggested telling them, them that I have a cancer which is incurable, but treatable. So let's think of the treatment as something additional that is necessary to life, like eating and bathing and sleeping, except for the fucking side effects. I do not want to get fat on steroids. I am going to remain beautiful till I die. The eyebrows are a good start. I had them tattooed when I heard I might have cancer. And dying early helps, of course. I mean, choose a way to die, not a stroke, not with a body that bit by bit is falling apart, not under a bus so my loved ones have no time to get used to it. I'm going to imagine I have 10 years. What? will I do with those 10 years? I will ride and swim in the sea. I will wear beautiful clothes and good makeup. I will take care of my skin and my hair and my feet. I will read the books I love, some Dickens again, I think, to begin with, because he brought to birth in me my love of words and my respect for them. I will listen to music, go to concerts, I will sing, I will have piano lessons. I will write and write and write. I will write poetry. I will contemplate, I will learn to contemplate. I will practice contemplation. I then had a long period of being considered for a clinical trial taking all the tests for the clinical trial, being accepted onto it, trying to absorb the information I needed. 26th April. Julian of Norwich writes of an experience she had had of being taken in her imagination under the broad water to the seabed. She writes, one time my understanding was led down into the sea ground and there I saw hill and dales green, seeming as they were covered in moss with rack and gravel. There, she says, she understood that if a man or woman were under the broad water, if he might have sight of God, so, as God is with man continually, he should be safe in body and soul and take no harm, and overpassing, he should have more solace and comfort than all this world can tell. For God will that we long to see him continually, though we think it be but little. And in this belief, he makes us evermore to get grace, for he will be seen and he will be sought. He will be abiding and he will be trusted. I had not paused on this passage before, but do so today because I read the experience of being underwater this time, as one of being an, in an unfamiliar environment, one in which one cannot breathe or move habitually or be in any kind of control. Of course, I relate it to my situation of being in a new world full of unknown and unanticipable surprises, most of them fearful, out of control. I have written down the full drug regime and its potential side effects to help me gain an oversight and some control of what is to happen to me so that I can prepare myself to ameliorate it all and keep smiling and sane. But in fact, I come away from doing so feeling completely overwhelmed and panicked. Control is the last thing I feel. Vulnerable, exposed and helpless is what I feel. Think about what you can control, I decide, trying to take myself in hand, trying not to give in to the panic. I start to write a diary list of what is to happen on chemotherapy days, thinking about adding in treats, thinking about the book to read or podcast to listen to while the infusion was happening, thinking about how to avoid infection, where I would buy face masks, 
but you try finding those kinds of face masks online. All that comes up are the sort that you plaster on your face for beauty. And adding the word protecting only turns up facials that offer protection against the weather. What is the technical term for those blessed things? Not a problem these days. <laughs> Where around guys I would go for long walks on steroid days to tire myself out, how I would make sure I drank three liters of water a day. I even start thinking about what I would do in hospital for three weeks if I have to be isolated for the stem cell transplant. And it is all too much. It is like being rushed off to a holiday when you have had no time to pack properly. The treatment is about to start. I am about to enter an utterly new and unfamiliar world like Julian's broad water in which I don't even know if I will be able to breathe and I am completely unprepared. I hate being unprepared. Sean takes me in his arms as I weep. It is only long, quiet, tuning in contemplative prayer that brings some measure of peace to my soul. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives, says Christ. Peace will not come from external control because there is only so much I can control. I can only hope to make friends with the cancer and all it entails respond accordingly and find my peace deep within myself and deep within all that I encounter, God in all. And oh, how this becomes the most important thing now. I think I will see if I can meditate rather than read while the chemotherapy infusion is being given. A challenge to find God in healing poison. The Julian passage and its meaning for me now remind me of I Built My House by the Sea by Carol Bialok, a favorite poem that can mean so many things. Now I read it and the sea becomes my cancer. I built my house by the sea, not on the sand, mind you, not on the shifting sand, and I built it of rock a strong house by a strong sea. And we got well acquainted, the sea and I, good neighbors, not that we smoke, spoke much. We met in silences, respectful, keeping our distance, but looking our thoughts across the fence of sand. Always the fence of sand, our barrier, always the sand in between. And then one day, and I still don't know how it happened, the sea came without warning, without welcome even. Not sudden and swift, but a shifting across the sand like wine, less like the flow of water than the flow of blood, slow but flowing like an open wound. And I thought of flight, and I thought of drowning and I thought of death. But while I thought, the sea crept higher till it reached my door. And I knew that there was neither flight nor death nor drowning, that when the sea comes calling, you stop being good neighbors, well acquainted, friendly from a distance neighbors. And you give your house for a coral castle and you learn to breathe underwater. I tried to open myself to this newness by not hankering after what had been. I am a person with cancer. So I thought to myself, find a way of making that joyful or it will become a source of bitterness and I cannot let my blood be a source of bitterness. Finally, the treatment regime begins. I dread this. I dread it. All the cells in my body shrink from what is to come. But to counter the dread, 
on the first day, on the day of my first chemotherapy infusion, I dress carefully in shades of chestnut and warm mustard yellow. I put makeup on my face, bright lipstick on my lips, and I wear my pearls. I breathe deeply. I put my shoulders back and I walk towards my healing poison. Thursday, the 2nd of May. It is quieter up here in the chemotherapy village, but my heart, which is thumping, brief, briefly fails at the sight of the other patients, those among whom I now count myself, some of them really obviously unwell, creeping with sticks or wheeled in wheelchairs, their faces gray or yellow. The face of the lady in the wheelchair who comes up in the lift with us is worn out, her eyes closing with weariness. And there is an atmosphere of quiet resignation amongst those waiting, not happy. We sit near the window, away from the other patients, and look at the view, taking in the light and air. Sean notices the word mother in the middle of the word chemotherapy, and we are heartened by that and think we will call the chemotherapy village mother care. But then we are scolded by Denise, the nurse, because she hasn't found me amongst the patients outside suite A when it is time for me to come in. So I am a bit flustered, an immediately infantilized patient, not wanting to keep the nurse waiting when I go in. And another nurse briskly says, I've kept seat six for you. I look around, bewildered at what at first impression is a combination of three implausible scenes. A pedicure salon with those seats that massage your back while you have your feet done, occupied by the most unlikely clientele. Or an airport waiting area for first class passengers because the seats are so big with spaces between them, only the passengers aren't smart business people. And the lounge in an old people's home. Then I see a big six above one of the squashy bright purple pedicure chairs and go and sit on it still shocked that I am one of the protagonists here. The seat is for me. I am ill. Nurse Jing comes to set me up. Tut, tut, my veins are not at all satisfactory. Nothing on the right arm, something on the left. I will be gentle, she says. She will use the smallest needle. In the cannula goes, just below my left hand. It hurts. Then she sets up a small drip, a saline solution to flush out the cannula. Soon after, Nurse Denise appears. She changes the flushing out drip bag for the hydration drip bag. Half an hour of saline. Then, the car fills a mib. Swiftly, briskly, but carefully set up by two nurse nurses double checking the process. My name and date of birth asked for again. My hospital number read out. The bag hung from the drip machine, the silver plastic sheath over the bag now sporting a released label, connected to the cannula in my wrist, and I am off. For all the drama I have built up in my mind, for all my intention to receive the chemotherapy consciously, imagining my body porously receiving it, accepting it as treatment and not rejecting it, the fact is that at this moment, I desperately need a pee. So I have to get up, unplug the drip and make my way unsteadily to the mercifully proximate lavatory. I don't swoon or feel sick. I feel spaced out, but that could just be the weird situation I'm in. When I sit down again, I meditate and go all internally receptive. The words you told me you said, dear A, before you were anaesthetized for your heart bypass operation sound in my heart. Father, into thy hands, I commend my spirit. The half hour passes quickly. Then another half hour of hydration to help my body receive the carfilzomib. You have tolerated it well, says Nurse Denise approvingly as she changes the bags. Infantile still, I am glad, wanting to please Denise, but of course I am also dripping, ha ha, with relief that I haven't reacted badly. 
I totter home with Sean, light-headed and shaky, but mostly with relief. I want, quite specifically, primavera risotto and salad for su supper, not too much, lots more water, and a long soak in an Epsom salt bath. I had four long months of the induction chemotherapy. Then I had to have my stem cells harvested, which involved, among other things, being infused with an enormous bag of a chemotherapy called cyclophosphamide. After that, my hair started falling out. This had been the side effect that terrified me most of all. It wasn't meant to happen now with cyclophosphamide, only if I had the transplant. Monday, 7th October. Hanks of hair coming out in my hands, in the bath and at the sink. More is on my head than is coming off. I keep muttering, my heart hammering as the ball of hair grows and grows. I didn't wash my hair yesterday. Would washing it make things worse or just reveal the inevitable? This morning I have to wash it and my bath swims with hair. I, who cannot bear a single hair dallying in the bathroom or on my clothes or anywhere apart from people's heads, I, who am avid about clearing up my own hair mess in a bathroom, I am wading through hair. I am just as avid cleaning up now, but the task is Herculean. My Orgean stable keeps filling up as more hairs fall from my head, catch in my comb, settle in the sink. Hercules had a day. I have a train to catch. I don't know if I'm making things worse by washing it, but once I have started, I can't stop. I have to comb it out. I have to dress it. I am as gentle as my shaking hands can be. Eventually, it is done and it looks normal. You wouldn't notice, but I have hands full of hair to show Sean. He suggests an artist might make something of it, and we remember Mona Hatoum, whose enormous installations featured quantities of hair twisted and woven and turned into rope and curtain. I like the metaphor, but hate the reality. I really dislike that work. I think of concentration camps and the use to which inmates hair was put after their heads had been shaven. The only place for my great switch of hair is in the compost, making new life. I hope it does. I think this is a good rehearsal. It is such a shock. And if I have, if I have the stem cell transplant and it all falls out, I have had a taste of what that is like. It cannot be hidden, you see. Everything else I have gone through is on the inside. I can hide away during the post chemotherapy sickness, put makeup and a smile on my face when I'm out. I've enjoyed being told how well I look, defiant in the face of the challenge of cancer. But everyone will see the hair loss. And however quickly my friends will get used to how I look, the initial view is a shock. And for the general public, baldness on women is just weird. I am randomized to have a stem cell transplant. That was the main part of the clinical trial, comparing the highly invasive, utterly horrible stem cell transplant with more chemotherapy. I drew the short straw, though it is the gold standard treatment. And I warn you in this next extract, extract there is more swearing. Thursday, 10th October. I am to have the transplant. So the worst has happened and I'm still upright. I am not now letting myself think for one moment, well, just one briefly, about what might have been, about the fact that my life might have resembled something relatively close to normal if the result had gone the other way. The sea will come in all the way. I will have to learn to breathe underwater. I determine this. Even as my bone marrow is destroyed by the killer chemotherapy melphalan and my harvested stem cells return to me for my rebirth, I will let myself be transformed in my spiritual marrow. I determine that this will be an experience to relish and be changed by, for the better, 
not something to shrink from and wish away. But oh, fuck, 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 fuck. Hearing this feels worse than hearing the original diagnosis of cancer, believe it or not. Friday the 11th of October. How do you make a line shorter without doing anything to that line? You draw a longer line next to it. Now, I'm not at all troubled by my hair falling out. There's no need to hang on to it. It falls like autumn leaves from a tree preparing for winter. It will all go, and in the spring, it will return. It is not precious to me anymore, not this failing thatch. My riding hat swivels on my head now so much hair has gone. I ride Larcelle, the pony, and I think she can feel my discombobulation. She is as jumpy as I am. But it is a magnificent ride in the driving rain and buffeting wind, some stirring canters and long, heart-expanding views of the bosomy Sussex hills all the way to the shining sea. Once I have returned Larcelle to her stable and given her water, once I am out in the rain again and on my own, tears fall. My hair keeps falling out until finally, when I wash it, what little is left turns into a matted lump on top of my head. I can do nothing with it, nothing at all. Monday, 14th October. I look at myself in the mirror inquiringly. This tangle has precipitated the moment, but I am ready. Ready to shave it all off. I am to be shriven before I enter my anchor hold. Encouraged by Sean, who is rightly convinced that for this task I need a barber's shaver, not scissors, we enter a gentleman's barber in Newcomen Street near Guy's. I speak to the man at the desk who has a kind face. I'm not a gentleman, I say, but I have to shave my hair off because it's falling out anyway from chemotherapy. I have cancer. His face softens and he says, of course, and ushers me to a chair. I remove my cap and reveal the ruination of my head of hair. Sean sits in quiet attendance. Then this angel of a man gently, oh, so gently shaves my head, carefully approaching the tangled knot, working his way over the contours of my scalp, leaving an inch of hair, which is mercifully still evenly distributed a silver grey, revealing my head, revealing me. I look at myself in the mirror and I see that I am fine. I am revealed and what is revealed is just fine. I don't mean the appearance of me exactly, more that with nothing covering me, nothing to hide behind or pretend with, entirely on show, I am nothing to be ashamed of. I feel as vulnerable as I have ever felt, but I am also strangely relieved and liberated. I am fine until a customer who has witnessed the proceedings while having his own prolific haircut walks past me on his way out and says, you look even better than when you came in, more badass. And then I dissolve into tears and the beautiful angel, Al, quietly continues to give an artistic finish to my shaven head. We begin to speak to each other. I tell him a bit about my cancer. He tells me a bit about himself. He is Kurdish. His heart is breaking over what is happening to his people in Northern Syria. He says Kurds are not safe even here. We are Muslims helping the West, he says. That makes us a target for those who think we are betrayers. We are in compassionate communion as Al carefully neatens my crop. What is happening to me is so utterly unimportant in the context of the continued destruction of his people. 
but the tender attention Al gives my unimportant hair is our place of communion. What I had dreaded with the deepest dread I had had in all this time since my cancer was diagnosed is become a transcendent experience in which I am attended by an angel of the first order. It is one of the best experiences of my life so far. I am profoundly blessed. And so the stem cell transplant, every bit as awful as it threatened to be, came to pass. And then I embarked on an 18 month maintenance regime, which I am just about uh, um, coming to the end of two more months to go. The maintenance regime commenced just as COVID-19 bit and we all went into lockdown. Truly, it has felt that my endurance is no longer my own. Everyone is going through a version of what I am going through. Again and again, as I hope these previous excerpts show, I have fallen into despair, struggled, been picked up again and again, blessed, again and again supported by my beloved dear readers, by nature, by Julian, by God. Here's what I wrote right at the end of the book. Sunday, 22nd March. I read on the Myeloma UK website that in the next few days, I will be advised to self-isolate for 12 weeks. So be it. Here's my prayer of preparation. God! Help me to let the waves of fear pass over and away. Help me to be porous, not prickly with the universe. Help me to practice what quietens my mind, what generates energy, what makes me laugh, what helps me sleep. Help me to think of a good disciplined way to spend time online. Help me prepare my stubborn soul to ask for help. I really need help with this. Help me to understand I am helping just by staying safe. Amen. As I write the prayer, my heart falters and my tears fall. So many more miles to go. How will I bear it? Like this. I put on some lipstick, straighten my shoulders, open my heart and walk towards the next challenge. Thank you. Thank you so much indeed, Claire, for sharing so much with us. And I've, I've not read your entire book, but you brought so much of that into stark reality of what you've shared with us just now. Uh, in a sense, it's almost, <laughs> it's almost a shame to ask you questions and perhaps let more of it contemplate and flow over us. Um, but if you don't mind, we, we, we might and entertain some questions from, um, from those who might pose them. Um, I'm sure people will have questions and they'll start coming through. So um, I, I'll kick us off with, with um, one. I was struck by, by something that you wrote very early on in, at the start of your book when you said, walk with me and don't walk away. Did you find that people did walk away mm. uh, and was that because of the cancer or because of a faith aspect or whatever uh, yes some some people did uh, it's a very hard thing to hear um, I, I chose not to make any kind of a secret of it right from the start um, but you become a spectre at the feast because you become a reminder to everybody of their mortality 
so I, of course I tried to understand it was that wasn't always easy but I tried tried to understand I'm, I'm better at this now than I was um, and uh, and actually as regards the letters the dear readers and now anybody who, who reads my book it's, it's not an easy read and um, and the but but the but the request is to is to just walk alongside and so often uh, that's what we need from our loved ones. It's really hard when you, when you. I think it's probably harder to be the one who loves the person who's got cancer than the one who's got cancer because at least you know what it is when you've got it. Whereas here you are and you're often feeling very helpless. But simply not to go away, simply to read is what I ask my dear readers. This was such a great service to me. Uh, and it's not easy to stay still, kind of helplessly, but your attention. Um, Cecily Saunders, this was her inspiration for her, the hospice movement. She said, we can't cure people, we can't cure people, they're going to die. They're definitely going to die. They're in a hospice because they're going to die. What we are going to do is attend upon them, serve them with our attention. And Simone Vale says attention is prayer. It's such a powerful thing. Uh, but it's not easy. And did you feel some of that attention came from some of the responses you got from friends or just from being able to share something, having that outlet with those individuals in the first place? Well, it, 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 yes. I mean, knowing I was writing to loving people, this was, this was very important because I could Im imagine them as I wrote. I could I'd bring them to mind. And also there was one dear reader who, when I asked him if he would be a dear reader, he said, um, oh yes, I'd be very, I'd be very happy to be a dear, of course, Claire, if this would help you. Uh, he said, I, I, a friend of ours asked him if, he went to prison and he asked if uh, he could write to us. And, and we said, yes, of course. So he wrote to us from prison and, and after a few weeks, it got really, really bo boring. <laughs> So I had this challenge and it was such a good challenge to have in the middle of all this was, I am not going to bore Jonathan. <laughs> I'm not going to bore. So every week I thought something either funny or interesting or, or, or shocking or surprising is going to appear in this. And that was a really good thing to find that. This is finding joy all the time, all the time, finding joy. So, so the writing to my dear readers brought, uh, brought that out in me. But it's also true uh, that I was... I said you don't have to respond, but people did respond and they responded magnificently. They would tell me their stories with this with honesty and and they were beautiful. Absolutely beautiful, really. And this has gone on. They're still they're staying the course with me, Mike. Two and a half years it will have been. What a marathon. Don't know, think they realize quite what they'd signed up for. for. <laughs> um, and they're still responding. Yeah. That's and, Oh, does it help? Yeah. I was really struck by the, uh, oh, sorry, Dean Sue, would you like to ask something? I was just going to ask about, um, you, you've hinted at it, the whole consolation, desolation, and the Ignatian spirituality, and said you were going to try and meditate through it. I imagine that was incredibly hard. Mm -hmm. But how much did, or what were the benefits, do you feel, of having that understanding of Ignatian uh, spirituality and a way of being and living through what you lived through? Well, it, it was really helpful because it meant that I, I could, and because I practiced, because I had been through the spiritual exercises, which are not for the faint hearted. I think I'm a bit of a spiritual extremist actually, but Ju I think Julian of Norwich is a spiritual extremist too. So I'm in good company, but he, but, but that practice of, of feeling your way to your place of desolation. So you're not, you're not flinching from it. You're trying to move towards it. And, and um, my doctorate look, uh, with the, the really important concept in my doctorate was porosity. So the sense of allowing this, allowing this hard thing to, to come towards you and to move towards it gently um, and, and to trust because you had experienced it before, that by moving towards it in this way, by not rejecting it, consolation would come. And, and, it, and it did come. And at, <laughs> when you're feeling really, really, really grim, 
it's just really, really, really grim. You know, you don't, you don't, when you're feeling ill, you don't, that is, it's just awful. There's no, I'm, there's no, I'm not a saint. I'm absolutely not a saint. But it, in a sense that having got through that and then knowing I would have to face it again the next week, will have to face, I'm, this is still happening, will. Tomorrow I have chemotherapy, tomorrow night I will be feeling rubbish. That, um, that you can then almost for, forgive it. You can, you can, there's a kind of diffusing aspect to it as well. It's just, you don't get knotted up and caught up in it. And there's something about it being blood cancer too that it allows this flowing. And it just feel the Ignatian thing and also the use of imagination so I, so this is Ignatian, kind of. I would imagine Christ as the cancer in my blood, or I would Im imagine Christ as the chemotherapy coming into my blood. Really contrary things that would make me look again and feel again what was happening to me and look at it differently, uh, receive it differently, and and and, ble and blessings come come through that. Remarkable. Um, we've got a couple of questions coming in now, Claire. Um, yeah, I, I was going to ask about the Kurdish barber as well, actually. Um, uh, uh, Neil asks, I was struck by the paradox of healing poison. I must admit I was too as well. Uh, I'll explain that to my students when I see them. Really. And the very moving accounts of the healing ministry of the Kurdish barber. How has this whole experience changed your view of healing? Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh. <laughs> oh gosh, I, I am nowhere near at the end of what I think of, <laughs> about healing. I, I, I've had so much on a journey. Um, I, yes, oh gosh. So uh, I was diagnosed, uh, and, it, and it, I, I think I was telling you beforehand, Mike, because I was diagnosed before the cancer had done any damage to my body. So I experienced no symptoms of the cancer whatsoever. All the pain and suffering I have gone through, all of it has been through the treatment. <laughs> so I have absolutely had to take it on trust from my doctors that the numbers they're showing me are true about the incursion of the myeloma into, into my blood, the proteins it's developing and so forth. <laughs> um, and and I and I, I mean I, I was brought up in quite a kind of homeopathic, you know, uh, complementary alternative medicine kind of way, rejecting all drugs. I know I really I would I wouldn't take an aspirin unless I absolutely absolutely had to. And I went 180 degrees the other way, and I told my friends they were not to give me any alternative approaches. I did not want to hear about coffee enemas and blah, blah, blah. And funnily enough, the one bit of food that I was told not to have with the carfilzomib, this specific chemotherapy, was green tea. Now, everybody says green tea is the best possible thing for cancer. It's just brilliant. Well, I wasn't, I actually wasn't allowed to have it. So I just put myself in the hands of these allopathic doctors and I did what they told me and I received, and I, and I, 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 it was almost like a conversion, you know, just, a, but, but a kind of fierce one. I was fiercely converted and anyone who tried to tell me otherwise, I really fought against it. Um, now, I, so that, that was the actual drugs, the actual drugs themselves and the, tra the transplant. Uh, uh, but of course the, and there's so much poison and pain that comes with that, but then the hands that administer this are full of love. I, I was thinking what, what one time, you know, you go into a hospital and it's such a sterile environment. Everything's clean as a whistle, apart from <laughs> one experience, which is in the book. You'll have to read the book to, to, to hear about the bit of carrot. But uh, yeah, clean as a whistle. Absolutely nothing growing anywhere. Um, and um, and how because this contrasted so much with my experience of nature as healing. Uh, and I and I thought. Uh, uh, the, the tenderness, the softness, the, the lovingness that I feel from nature in the hospitals coming from the people who tend me. And that was in, there was so much of that. It was absolutely based in it. And then the healing that came from the dear readers, the healing that came from encounters like with people like Al. He, all of this is healing, healing, healing. And in the end, I just had to give in and realize how much God loved me. 
which I just didn't, I just don't believe. I don't believe, I, why, why? I mean, there are so many billions of people in the world with so many needs. Why would anyone? And the NHS, the NHS teaches you this. The NHS expresses unconditional love. The NHS is like God. And I, I would I have spent, I couldn't have spent the money that's been spent on me. It would have bankrupted me several times over with the treatment that I've had, but the NHS gives it, it just gives it. Uh, so all this healing and, th and now, now that I'm coming to the end of this grim, poisonous, allopathic, I'm beginning to look at other things. I might start drinking green tea. <laughs> and I have been very careful about my diet. I haven't been mad about, about my diet. About the green tea now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, July. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Claire. We've got a, a question from Canon Phillip. Uh, could you say more about riding in terms of a relationship of trust and joy with another non-human companion during this period? It sounds as if it was a very different kind of spiritual exercise. Oh, and how. Thanks. What a great question. That sounds like someone who, if not riding, then something else, but other creatures. Yes. So um, being out in nature was is so so important um, to, to to me and to to keep to have to keeping me going through all of this process. But the thing about being in nature, out in nature on a horse, is that you're somehow really really uh, bathed in nature because you're connected to the horse. This noble steed who deigns to bear you on her back or his back, so much bigger and stronger than you are. Um, and there you are connected to the horse and somehow therefore much more connected to nature. And there's a little bit of danger in it because the horse could jump at and They do jump at something or you have to attend to the horse as well as you can't just, you're not just sitting in an armchair, breathing in the lovely air and looking at the view. You're, you're connected to this creature and it makes the whole experience many, many more times over uh, porous to use that, that word again. Bring and, and this sense of your common animality. You know, Mary Oliver is a great inspiration to me too. And she, my goodness, she knows about common animality. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. Um, there's a comment here, but I'm sure it'll be good to hear your your comments uh, around this. Uh, saying uh, for, from Bob, uh, thanks for sharing your experiences, Claire. Uh, Bob had chemo four years ago. I'm currently in remission. Praise God. It was suggested I write down each evening four blessings he'd received that day, and it was incredibly helpful. I'm sure there might must be either some resonance or some thoughts behind that, Claire. Most, most definitely. And it's such a fantastic, gentle discipline to, uh, to enact. Yes, I, one of the things that again and again and again I came back to was gratitude. And, and, and again, because I was writing, you see, these things were coming to mind, you know, that's what was so good about, about having the writing to do, having the people to write to. So yes, bless you, Bob. <laughs> Thank you. It, it's just the teaching, cancer teaches you to live as you should live. Facing your mortality teaches you to live as you should live. <laughs> Mike, you've frozen. Or I have. Can I, can I just say, Claire, that um, just kind of following on from that, one of the things we did um, at the end, towards the end of last year, because we recognised um, that the staff almost needed um, a boost of some sort um, as we were going through the COVID experience. Um, and I, we got them to do um, an examine, a version of the examine to look back at what they'd planned for last year. And the, the, the point was, it didn't matter if it didn't happen. The point was that they'd planned it. And then as, as what happened that they hadn't planned. Mm -hmm. And what was astounding, I think, was the energy level that actually went up week by week as people presented. And also the realization that it, they'd actually done more than they realized. Um, and, you know, we would, I was trying to say to them, we move on so quickly, we don't s spend time thinking about the things that matter and what we have done together. 
Um, and, it, it, you know, the Ignatian examine is a wonderful thing um, with the blessings thing, the four blessings. What yeah. has God given us through this? Yeah, definitely. I, it, it, that's quite a thought, isn't it? And I, I suppose we've all been given the opportunity to examine, to reflect, to look back and think because of the pandemic. Um, it's really important isn't it because otherwise you just move on yeah. I, I'm so prone to that just what's the next thing what's the next thing you know an absolute overachiever so anxious to get to the next thing you know you get you climb a peak and you're so busy thinking about the next peak you don't look at the view yeah Matt it's bonkers man yeah. that's not the way to that's and what, what the, the peace service installation that is happening in the cathedral from Friday night onwards, for me, there's this opportunity because people have written prayers on those devs and they've written prayers from before COVID because we were meant to have the exhibition last year through this year, through the COVID year. And I think that there will be something profoundly moving to stand under those devs with those prayers and offer back to God a year of disruption and I guess it's the same for you uh, it's two years of disruption in your life um, and to think about the, the the sorrows but also the joys yes yes uh, uh, now Ignatius taught me this so this is not all about happy endings finding joy in my cancer is not about happy endings it's not about being panglossian or pollyanna-ish because the, it only works if you go to the pain, through the pain. And I think that's what the crucifixion teaches us. The resurrection comes after the crucifixion. And in my bed in, intensi uh, in, intensi in, in isolation with the stem cell transplant at the absolute worst moment when I can't tell you how ill I felt and was, that's, that's what I remembered with Julian, really, that to pass through this... Um, to pass through this, not in any way to deny it. And, and in my case, then I was afterwards, I, I scribbled notes, but I was feeling so ill, I could, couldn't bear to type anything. But I wrote afterwards to do, in a sense, to do justice to the pain in order to do justice to the joy. Yeah. Mm. It's a wonderful message, yeah. Welcome back, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've just been underwater and back out again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, really. So this take you 10 seconds to work out you're the one whose connection is lost. That's why I was frozen on the screen. Uh, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll have missed those last, uh, last few uh, points and comments. Um, perhaps you might have cover, covered this one already, but I'll ask a question in, in a sense, a professional question, really, um, on both fronts and whether um, there might be a couple of key points uh, for those working in healthcare professions or those key points that you might want to put forward from your experiences for those of, of people of faith from what you've learned and experienced firsthand. Sorry, did you say you want two key points? Yeah, uh, particularly for, for us as healthcare professionals, but also what about people of faith and different faiths as we, as we had with your encounter with the barber as well? Yes. Okay, so on the professional front, and now this was the really interesting thing to me because I'd written about medical ethics and specifically about the ethics of medical research on humans. And when I started working in medical ethics in the 90s, the, um, the concept of autonomy uh, and consent was king it had the pendulum had absolutely swung from um medical paternalism you know doctor knows best doctor's duty of care to what does the doctor know it's all about patient autonomy and patient consent and uh and particularly in the context of medical research on humans where you're being asked not just to have treatment but necessarily it might even be a non-therapeutic research project but anyway to, not just to have treatment but to contribute to knowledge in general so you're doing something uh, giving something back and indeed as is certainly the case with this trial there are things that you have to do uh, so not just the treatment itself um, which was in every case, the treatment I got was as good as it could be, you know, wh whichever it would have been, that was the design of the trial, but you have to have extra bone marrow biopsies. And you, if you've read the book, Mike, you know just how yeah. unutterably vile bone marrow biopsies are. 
Um, I also have to collect my urine for 24 hours every month, every month for the last two and a half years. I've been in this big bottle and nobody thinks what it's like to be a woman. I'm sorry to be so explicit, but why not? Yeah, yeah. You know, women do not, you, <laughs> it's not the same <laughs> as if you're a chap <laughs> peeing in a bottle. So, everybody, so these extra things you have to consent to. Uh, so consent, massive thing. And, and um, indeed, uh, uh, it, it, it does matter uh, it, because the, the, there will be things that the patient knows and feels that the doctor simply cannot know and feel because they're not, you're not the same person. You don't know what it is. So whatever, even, even if it, from the doctor's point of view, this is completely the right thing in the patient's best interests, the patient may have their own perfectly good reasons for saying no. And the doctor won't necessarily know that. So you must always ask consent. However, the legal definition of consent is that it is adequately informed, given by a competent person and not coerced. Well, I can tell you, I was none of those things when I consented to take part in the trial. I certainly, well, I wasn't competent because I was reeling from the diagnosis. So I couldn't take in any information. So I wasn't adequately informed and I was definitely coerced not by the doctor, not, but by the situation. Yeah. So, so of course, obtain consent, seek consent, but this duty of care, this duty to act always in the patient's best interest, this duty only ever to ask of the patient what it's right to ask of the patient does not go away. So this is this balance of the, um, um, well, the goal, what you're trying to achieve um, what it is needed to do in order to achieve it and the agreement of the people taking part, that balance of those three approaches is really, really critical. Actually, it's quite, when I think about it now, it's quite um, gratifying to find that what I had written about as a theoretician works in practice, but I hadn't realized just in a sense how meaningless consent in that positive way yeah. became, even though, as I say, you do need to be given the right, the chance to refuse. So that, I would say that. Um, um, I think also this question of pain and discomfort um, I, that I, I did, one of the reasons I tried to do justice to the pain, the reality of the pain was I wanted it to be heard. It's very, you know, and this is a blessed thing. We forget pain very quickly. I think you never, I haven't had a child, but I think you would never have a second child um, if you remembered the pain of childbirth but uh, it is replaced by joy, the joy of the child. And, it, and you forget, and I now cannot remember just how grim, just how grim I felt during the stem cell transplant or during those bone marrow biopsies. So I tried to really, really do justice to the pain while I still remembered in those diaries. Um, so, so that doc clinicians could see, just see what, see that. And, um, and it's not that, I don't think doctors should kind of melt with emotion over all of this. You know, you do have to make those tough decisions. You do have to ask us to, to go through these things. But for example, I, I, I think more research could be done. To, so Melphalan, I mean, I, ha, I sort of had, have, had this quarrel with my clinicians. Um, uh, uh, Melphalan, this kills off your bone marrow before you then have your own stem cells back. And it's been used for decades, actually, for this for this transplant process. It was it's based on the mustard gas that was used in the Second World War. Quite a few chemotherapies are, and it is hellish. It it doesn't just kill off your bone marrow; it kills off all the bacteria in your gut from your mouth to your backside. So you are vomiting. You are you have diarrhea. You um, your mouth becomes full of sores. You get it's called mucositis, which sounds so nothing, and you you it tastes revolting your mouth tastes revolting but you have to keep on trying to eat and trying to drink in order to keep your body able to respond to the transplant and to get get better but melphalan works you know it does kill off the bone marrow it does what it needs to do in order for the stem cells to to graft to transplant so why would you do any research to try and replace melphalan well the only reason you do it is because it's so horrible but that's a patient perspective. And I thought if I could only really show how horrible it is, then maybe we'll, can, can, we'll so, so patient agency in, in designing of research, I think will be a jolly good thing, particularly patients who are, you know, well, understand their conditions well, chronic. So that's my second key point for doctors. Uh, 
clergy, clergy, people of faith, <laughs> people of faith. Oh, well, I, I, I think, um, I, uh, as I said, I'm a bit of a spiritual extremist, but I, um, I think I, I wasn't, I'm not, a, I, I was ca- uh, baptized as a, as a, as a baby into, into, as a, as a Christian. So formally I, I am a Christian, but I was brought up in a, in a funny sort of philosophy, which is very influenced by the East. Um, and, and I, and I sort of ran away from that back into Christianity and, and, and embrace Christianity as a, t- as a teenager. Um, so I've always had this slight feeling that I'm not really a proper Christian um, and I don't quite know how to be a Christian. And there are all sorts of things in Christianity that I don't know if I believe them or not. Um, I mean, things like God is a man, you know, or, you know, the father and Jesus is a man, you know, this sort of ma- masculine thing. Um, uh, um, oh, lots of ways in which I feel completely rubbish as, as, as a Christian. But um, I felt with this situation, I could somehow put all that to one, all the things I thought I ought to believe, just put them to one side and know the essence of the story and, and receive it and let it carry me. And boy, did it carry me um, in such a real way. This is what I was trying to say at the beginning about embodied theology. Uh, it was, and this is what it seems to me Julian is doing, is what's, why her writings are so powerful, even 600 years later. You, you sort of experience it with her because she describes what she's going through rather than theorizing about it. So, uh, you know, I'm all for embodied theology, you know, be vulnerable. R- really, actually, think, did you know this is really important? <laughs> Because people don't get organised religion, really, and yet there's such a treasury to offer. And my work at Westminster Abbey Institute is so informed by this now. I'm interested in what brings this, brings spirit to life in our politicians, kindles that sense of of goodness, of of the wish to serve. You feel it. It's not just words on a piece of paper. You feel it. Yeah. That's really, really powerful, Claire. Um, there's a final question that's 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 come in at the moment, um, uh, and we may need to be brief with this as we as we close things off, really. And uh, the person says, "Your courage in the face of mortality, and Jesus' reaction at Lazarus' tomb, makes evolution, for which death is the driving force, a friend, incongruous." Scripture says it's an enemy. Do you agree? <laughs> Oh God, <laughs> holy scripture is very much to be studied mm. <laughs> so... and debated and, yeah. and quarreled with and wrestled <laughs> with, as Karen Armstrong says. <laughs> yeah, uh, because the first thing, the, the night that, that wonderful, the, the driver for evolution and. Yes. So this is, th- th- these questions are so open for me now, eternal life, you know. Mm-hmm. What is that? Yeah, <laughs> I think. What's going to happen after I die? <laughs> <laughs> it's such an exciting thing. I've no idea. I bet it's good, though. I bet it's brilliant. I think that's a brilliant point <laughs> to finish on. <laughs> Claire, it's been a wonderful evening. Uh, you've you've opened up so much to us and you've opened up so much of your journey and your thoughts uh, beyond this and and been with us for our questions it's been a privilege being alongside you just in this short hour and a bit really thank you very much indeed Claire Uh, we are we are blessed by your presence really Uh, so thank you very much indeed so virtual claps from all those around well and thank you so much for asking me it's it, I, it really is a privilege and i i love liverpool i love liverpool cathedral and i'm really sorry i can't be there i'm definitely going to come and see you sometime thank you for listening to me in t- in terms of listening uh you might have already have thought about this has are you thought of putting your book into an audio book because uh, it came across mm. so powerfully mm. compared to what one reads on the page mm. Well, no one's asked me. I, d- I mean, I don't quite know how you do that. So, well, I've asked you. <laughs> <laughs> I think that will be absolutely marvelous, really. All right. That? Well, I'll, I'll I'll talk to my <laughs> agent, as they say. Yeah. Well, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> do, do that. 
and say you've got all of these people who think it's it's a good idea. I, <laughs> you you brought it brought it to really to a different dimension for us on this one. Mm. Thank you very much indeed, Claire. Thank you very much. Uh, everyone still uh, with us. Many thanks for attending this lecture, and I hope you'll be able to join us in uh, two weeks' time. So we haven't got a lecture next week. Our next one, uh, Canon Neil's going to just share his screen with us, is in two weeks' time for our fifth and final lecture. So that's on the 1st of June, so not next Tuesday. I hope you'll be able to join us where the speaker will be myself. Uh, I don't um, guarantee to be anything near as eloquent as the way that Claire has been with us tonight, really. So. But please do uh, continue to spread the word about these free online lectures to your friends and colleagues. And also the fact that if you do miss them live, uh, they are all available to watch later. Um, Canon Stewart is putting together a playlist really, so you'll find them all in one location on our YouTube channel. And thanks again for joining us this evening. Take care everyone and go gently and hope to see you in a fortnight's time. But for now, uh, I do hope you'll stay with us online for our brief service of Compline being led tonight by Canon Philip and Canon Neil will voice the words of the congregation re responses where appropriate on our behalf. So let us pray. <coughs> the Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and a perfect end. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. Most merciful God. We confess to you before the whole company of heaven and one another that we have sinned in thought, word and deed and in what we have failed to do. Forgive us our sins, heal us by your spirit and raise us to new life in Christ. Amen. O oh God, make speed to save us. O oh Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. I will bless the Lord, who has given me counsel. At night also he has instructed my heart. I have set the Lord always before me. He is at my right hand, and I shall not fall. Therefore my heart is glad and my spirit rejoices. My flesh also shall rest secure. For you will not give me over to the power of death, nor suffer your faithful one to see the pit. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is the fullness of joy, and from your right hand flow delights forevermore. Give us, O God, a glad heart and a clear conscience, that as we come to this day's end, we may rest in peace with Christ our Lord. Amen. You, O Lord, are in the midst of us and we are called by your name. Leave us not, O Lord our God. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. For you have redeemed me, Lord God of truth. I commend my spirit. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Into your hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, 
which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, to be a light to lighten the Gentiles, and to be the glory of thy people Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. So let us pray. We pray this night for all those who face their own mortality, those who have been given a diagnosis of incurable illness, those who care for them, those who struggle to be in the presence of mortality. And we pray for a renewal of faith. We pray for intimacy and proximity to you. The almighty Lord, who is a strong tower to all who put their trust in him, to whom all things in heaven, on earth, and under the earth bow down and obey, be now and evermore our defence, and make us know and feel that the only name under heaven given for health and salvation is the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. May God bless us that in us may be found love and humility, obedience and thanksgiving, discipline, gentleness, and peace. Amen.